your Bible to Genesis chapter 9. I mean, that's, that ain't hard to find. First part of your Bible. I'll be preaching tonight on God's rainbow. God's rainbow. I was standing out there a while ago, and somebody said, there's a rainbow. They saw a rainbow right outside the door here. And we're going to be talking about that. So let's look at verse 8 in God's rainbow in Genesis chapter 9. And God spake unto Noah and his sons with him, saying, And I, behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your seed after you, and with every living creature that is with you of the fowls of the cattle and of every beast of the earth with you, from all that goeth out of the ark to every beast of the earth. And I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall all flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood. Neither shall there be any more be the flood to destroy the earth. And God said, this is the token of the covenant which I make between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations. I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. And it shall come to pass when I bring a cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. And I remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every living creature of all flesh, and the waters shall no more become a flood to destroy all flesh. Now the key verse is verse 16. And the bow shall be in the cloud, and I will look upon it, that I may remember the everlasting covenant between God and every living creature of all flesh that is upon the earth. Verse 17. And God said unto Noah, This is the token of the covenant which I have established between me and all flesh that is upon the earth. As we think about that, we've all seen the rainbow. Every time, I mean, you can even put on the sprinkler at home certain times and you'll see a, a, a rainbow off the sprinkler. And I think the best one I've ever seen is at Niagara Falls. And boy, I'm telling you, that water's coming over there. If you get it to the right angle, it's just a glorious uh, uh, rainbow. Now, Hebrews 11:7 7 says this. By faith Noah, being warned of God, excuse me, warned of things not seen yet, moved with fear, prepared an ark to the saving of his house, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is by faith. Now see, we have to have faith that God is going to keep his promise, and he always has kept his promise, and he always will. God cannot lie. So as we think about that, why did God destroy the earth? Why did he do that? Well, if you look back over one place, it's in Genesis chapter 6 and verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great upon the earth. Does that sound like today? Doesn't that sound like America today? I'm not talking about some foreign country. America's becoming a foreign country. A man was great in the earth and that every imagination of thoughts of his heart was only evil continually and it repented the Lord that he had made man on the earth and it grieved him in his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man, beast, and creeping things and the fowls of the air for it repented me that I made man. But I like this verse Number eight, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found grace. And you know, that's the way it is today. By grace are you saved through faith and not of yourselves. We need to find the grace of God and do it, whatever, whatever it is that he's got to say to us. So he said in verse 11, and I will establish my covenant with you, neither shall any flesh be cut off any more by the waters of the flood, neither shall it be any more be a flood that d destroy the earth. Now Paul said this, we are troubled on every side, 
yet not distressed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. Do you know that God's rainbow is seen in every cloud of trouble? When you're having trouble, you can always look for the rainbow. Always look for something that God has put out there to help you understand that he's still in control. He's in charge. I had a lady call this afternoon. I've been knowing her for about 44 years. And she said, I, I just have trouble. I have trouble. My husband's real bad. My husband's real bad. I said, what's going on? She told me all about it. And I said, well, don't you believe God? She said, I, I find it hard to believe God. Well, that was a good sign. I just took her back and showed her how to be saved. And she prayed the prayer and asked God to save her. She said, I don't feel anything. I said, no, it's facts and then feelings. It's not feelings and then facts. It's facts and then feelings. So I hope that she's doing good. She don't come to this church. She goes somewhere else. So don't worry about that. But you know, trouble comes to everybody sooner or later. I was talking to Paul a while ago. She was telling me about the trouble she had at her house just today. Trouble's here and trouble's there. Trouble's everywhere. Don't worry about it. Our families are having trouble. Our homes are having trouble. Our schools are having, they can't figure out how to get school started. You ever, you've been watching that at all? Well, we don't have enough teachers, or, or we can't, we can't uh, look face to face, and you can't go here, and you can't go there, and you got to wear a mask, and oh, good night. Churches have trouble. I pastored one church for 32 years. We had trouble every now and then in there. You know, people is the problem. You got to remember that. If you got people, you're going to have problems. This COVID thing is, <laughs> that's the biggest pro, uh, problem I've seen in my life. We went through polio. We went through all those swine flus and all that. They were no big deal, but this is a big deal. So uh, maybe it'll clear up after the 4th of uh, November. We don't know that. <laughs> but in Psalm 27, verse 1, Psalm of David, The Lord is my light, my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is, my strength, is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies, my foes, come upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. He's your strength, the Lord. And that's what I try to emphasize with that lady this afternoon. It's the word that does the work. Get the word in you, it'll keep the devil out of you. But a lot of people say, well, I don't care about that. I'm just going to do what I want to do. Well, you don't obey God, you'll be in trouble. He said in verse 3, Though a host should encamp about against me, my heart shall not fear. See, people are scared to death. I go around, I've been around probably everybody's house in here. And a lot of them, they come to the door and they, they, they're afraid to open the door. I guess it's me or the virus. I don't know which one it is. But guess what? I'm not afraid of them. See, I got the love of God. I don't mind going to see anybody. I don't care what's going on. I'll, I'll get through it because he said he would. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me, this will I be confident. Ask yourself the question, how confident are you in the Lord's word? How confident are you? Can you walk through the valley of the shadow of death like, like our brother did last night? 9.15, he walked out of this world right into the new world. And he's just happy as he can be today. He's not laying there like he was. He's not suffering like he was. And Brother John, thank you, Lord, for saving John. And when it's my time to go, I hope I can just go just like he did. Or I'd rather go into rapture, but we'll do what we can. <laughs> we'll take what we can get, right? He said again in Psalm 27, 4, One thing I desire of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to behold the beauty of the Lord and inquire in his temple. 
You know, we just can't fathom what it means to be in the presence of God. Him there and we're here. It's just, I just can't comprehend that, but I know it's going to happen. And verse 5 says, For in the time of trouble he shall hide me in his pavilion. Now what does that word mean? I used to go to Myrtle Beach uh, when I was a kid, and we went there all the time, and they said, we're going down to the pavilion. I didn't know what that was. It's a place to keep you out of the storm. You go into the pavilion. I didn't know that then. I, didn't, I don't know a lot of things about a lot of people and a lot of things and what they're talking about. But he says, In the secret of his tabernacle shall he hide me. He shall set me upon a rock. When the waters come, you need to be on a rock. We used to go out to, to a place on the Catawba River where I was raised, and there was a big dam out there, and you could see rocks. But every now and then, they would open the floodgates and the rocks would disappear, and the horn would blow, bah, bah, bah. Well, we had this great football player, his name was Harold Severance. And Harold Severance was always out there on the rock. But guess what? He got caught out there when they opened the floodgate. And I mean, he was one of these, what you call, super uh, athletic kind of football players. So when the water came up, Harold just said, don't worry about it. I'll just jump in and swim to shore. No, he didn't. The water swept him under a rock and held him there till he drowned. Some of the friends that was with him left early. and He said, I ain't worrying about it. I can swim. No, no. The water was so swift, it just sucked him right under. It was a bad day in Rock Hill High School when that happens. I can tell you that. Oh, the Superman died. They don't believe that, son. Superman don't die. Many new Christians think, now that I'm saved, everything's going to be all right. That's wrong. Everything ain't going to be all right. The devil's going to worry you to death. He will cause little things to be big things. And you'll just wonder what's going on. So trouble is coming. And trouble is not your enemy. Trouble's your friend. Do you know the reason I got saved, I was in trouble. I was a troubled kid from the time I was this big till 36 years of age. And if it hadn't have been for trouble, I wouldn't be here preaching tonight. Trouble is not my enemy, it was my friend. It ran me to God when nothing else would. The police couldn't run me to God. Principal in the school couldn't run me to God. My mom and daddy tried, they couldn't run me to God. But boy, when I got in so much trouble, I remember God answered prayer, and I called on the Lord. I said, Lord, I messed up my life. Help me, Lord. I didn't know. I didn't even know there was a Lord. I was just hoping he was up there. But for some reason, he loved me and saved me. And the next thing you know, I come home. Everything was good. The black cloud was gone. I said, man, let's get drunk. Because that's what I did. I was an alcoholic. Got a can of beer, started to drink it. My wife was standing right there. I went to drink that can of beer. All of a sudden, I never had conviction of anything. No conviction of nothing. Just do it. Man, the still small voice just hit me. said, what are you doing? Is this any way to repay me after all the trouble you've been in? And it clicked on like a light bulb that God was real. The devil was real. I'd been running with the devil and I had called on the Lord, and the Lord had got rid of the devil, and I poured out that can of beer, and I fell on my face, and I cried like a baby, and I said, oh, God, forgive me. Forgive me. I didn't know. I didn't know the devil was real, and I didn't know you was real. But, God, I believe now. And when I got up off my floor, my wife, she grabbed me. She said, oh, you rededicated your life. I said, no, no, I didn't have nothing to rededicate. I said, I've been saved like I heard about it a few times I went to church. And you know what? From that day on to right now, it's been a wonderful ride, I can tell you that. 44 years and about five months. But he took that alcohol away. People say, I can't quit smoking, I can't quit drinking, I can't, can't do this. Hey, let me tell you something. You get out on your face for God and really ask him, he can help you with that. He'll change your life. I know that. 
So trouble is not your enemy, it's your friend. It'll run you to God when nothing else will. What have I got to do? I just have to look for the rainbow. That's all. Rainbow out here, rainbow everywhere. He put it up there. Uh, the other morning, I was coming over here something real early. It's about before 7 o'clock. And there, out here over Daytona Beach, it was a rainstorm and had the prettiest rainbow right over there. You just got to look for the rainbow. That's all. Secondly, God's rainbow is in every uh, uh, cloud of trial. Trial. See, sometimes you're just going through a, a trial. Verse 13, I do set my bow in the cloud, and it shall be for a token of a covenant between me and the earth. See, we live by the grace of God. You know, we say I might be going here by the grace of God. I'll be there. By the grace of God, I'm going to do this. By the grace of God, I'm going to do that. It's all by grace. And it's by grace that you're saved through faith and not of yourselves. Compare your trials against Moses at the Red Sea. Can you imagine that? You got Pharaoh's army coming down and you're at the Red Sea and you don't know what you're going to do. How are you going to get across? Well, guess what? God just parted the Red Sea. <laughs> I like that part. He just stood the water up and he went over on dry land. Somebody said, this is old, but somebody said it years ago. Said, well, somebody said there wasn't but two feet of water. They walked across. Well, if it wasn't but two feet of water, that's a bigger miracle than dry land because he drowned every soldier they had in two feet of water. So which, which one you want to believe, dry land or two feet of water? It's a miracle anyway. God, my God is the miracle working God. I don't have to worry about it. He'll take care of me. What about Daniel? Daniel prayed, put in the lion's den. The lions could not eat him. You know why? He saw the bow. He'd seen the rainbow. And that's what we need to do. We need to look for the rainbow in every cloud of trouble. In Daniel chapter 6 and verse 20, my page just got wet a while ago. And when he came to the den, he cried with a limit, uh, uh, limited voice. Uh, uh, he was crying. That's what that means. Daniel, the king spake and said, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is thy God, whom thou servest, continually able to deliver thee from the lions? Then Daniel said unto the king, O king, live forever. My God has sent his angel and has shut the mouth of the lions, that they have not hurt me, for as much as him, uh, innocence was found in me, and also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. He saw the bow. The bow. See, if you'll just realize that God put that rainbow up there not for, to be pretty, although it is pretty, it's a promise to you that he'll be there for you. See, all you got to do is just put up the bow. Look for the bow. Look for that bow. We need to qu quit trying to fix everything and let God work it out. That's, when I work on things at my house, my wife will tell you, we throw it away. Because I will not read the instructions. I, I'm a firm believer of not, I can do it myself. <laughs> yeah, and I have, and that's why we threw it away. That's okay. Think about the three Hebrew uh, children, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Tied up, throwing the fiery furnace, they saw the bow in the fire. Who was in the bow with them? Jesus. And one of them looks like the Son of God. He was Jesus. A lot of, they didn't even smell like smoke. You can't say that about a lot of Baptists, can you? Some of them do smell like smoke. Nobody in here, of course. I'm not talking about you and Larry out there on TV. I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about them people out the door. You go to North Carolina a long time ago, not even the pastor, they'd go out and take a smoke. I wasn't a smoker. I said, where's the beer? Y'all going to smoke? I need a beer. 
Pastor Ralph Durham, a good friend of mine up in North Florida, had lightning strike his church, burn it to the ground. Guess what? Between the insurance and what people gave, he got a brand new church out of it. It was an old church. I mean an old church. You go through every fire of life, look for the rainbow. Always look for that rainbow. In Acts 16, how could Paul and Silas in jail sing and praise God? They saw the rainbow. The rainbow's always been there since God put it up there. It's always been there. We cannot, if we don't look for the rainbow, you won't see it. Trials should bring us closer to God. You know, when you're going through trouble, you'll pray. When there ain't no trouble, you don't pray. But we ought to be praying all the time. 1 Peter 1.7 says, That the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold, that perishes though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and the honor and the glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. It's just a trial. So we have to realize that we're just going through a trial. God's still in, char in charge. And the third thing, God's rainbow is every cloud of temptation. Temptation. Now I know y'all don't know the song I think it was in the late 40s, maybe some of you do, 50s, said, you came when I was alone. You were temptation. That's one of them old, old songs a long time ago. And that's what happens when you're by yourself, when you're alone, when, when you're not looking for it, that temptation will come to you. And it's up to you to make a decision whether I'm going to yield to the temptation or not. But if we'll listen to what God has to say, he said in verse 14, it shall come to pass when, the, when I bring the cloud over the earth that the bow shall be seen in the cloud. God's rainbow has been seen in every cloud of trouble, every cloud of trial, every cloud of temptation. 1 Peter 1.6 wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, you're in heaven is through manifold temptations. Think about that. Manifold temptations. I was at Silver Springs. Oh, back, see, I was saved in 76, going to Bible college. So I was probably 78, two years in, and I had started running the Super 60 program, so you know I've been in the Supers a long time. But I was up there, and they had just built a new boardwalk over the swamp. And you could walk out over the swamp, and there's gators, and there's all kind of different birds, and all kind of things you could see. And uh, <clears throat> they had built this new bar right out there where it was at. And it had ice cold beer mugs and they were playing music and I'm walking around and all of a sudden I smelled it. I smelled it. It reminded me of everything I'd ever did drinking beer and I was tempted and the devil, let me tell you what the devil said to me. I never forgot it. You ain't got no business out here with these old people. You got to remember I was in my 30s at that time. You're out here with these old people. You ought to be out there having fun like you always did. Every thought that I ever had of having fun and drinking flooded my mind. We had a guy named Bobby Hendricks with us. He was brand new. He just got saved and was in first year college. I was in my second, I think. I ran over there and I said, Bobby, come here, come here, Bobby, come here, come here. He said, what's the matter? I said, man, I said, I'm fixing to leave this place. I can't stay here. I said, the power of the devil has got me and I got, I got to get out of here. And we got down on our knees behind the big tree and we prayed and prayed and read some scripture. No temptation has taken me but such is common to man who will not tempt me above that I'm able but will with the temptation show me a way to escape that I may be able to bear it. 
Hallelujah. We got up from our knees. I walked back past that beer place. Nah. Not me, buddy. I wouldn't be here today. I'd be dead and in hell. But the devil knows what your weaknesses are. He knows what you like more than anybody else. And he'll bring it back to you. And what do you got to do? You got to say, not me. Lord, help me. And get some verses. That's what I told that lady this afternoon. I said, you need to get some of these verses I'm giving you. Write them down and memorize them. And Jesus fought the devil with the word of God. And that's the only way you're going to win. So that's what we need to be. Think about this. Job, he went through the test, lost all his children. We had a little grandbaby, Matthew Lyle, who was only a few hours old and died. Well, it was a bad day. But let me tell you something. Matthew was innocent. And the Bible says, when you die, you go back. Innocent. And if you're saved, you go back. If you're not saved, you go down. That's just the way it is. And we're going to see Matthew one day, and I believe Matthew will be a full age of 33 years, just like Jesus. And our old people will look like young people, and we'll know each other as we've known. It'll be a great day when we see our grand, first grandson died. So he went to the Testing of sickness, suffering, silence. You know, God didn't have to answer him, not Job. But he was one of his servants. And the greatest test for each child of God is death, just like last night on our dear friend, Brother John, Sr. But John was ready. Nana's mom. They brought her to our house. She'd lived with us five years. And you know, she used to hate me. I ain't joking. And I don't blame her. If, I, if a guy like me had showed up at my daughter's house, I might have killed him on the spot. <laughs> but I used to have to send my friend Don Yance by, pick her up, and I'd be waiting around the corner. And then we'd go off on a date, and I'd come back, and Yance and me would take her back home. I think that's an old country song called Just Walk On By, Wait On The Corner. I believe that is. That shows you where I really come from. But Diane Grace, her mama laid there. They brought her in on a Monday morning. She was gone Thursday morning. And she just raised her hand and was gone. Diane Grace, think about that. We get sick, we get worried, we get upset. But listen, you're not ready to die. You don't get dying grace until you're ready to die. You don't have to worry about it. You're going to have trouble, trials. When you need dying grace, you're going to get dying grace. Well, think about this. Here's a little poem. Between here and sunset, between here and sunset, there'll be rivers to cross. Winds may be around me, my ship may be tossed. But the pilot that guides my vessel you see, between here and sunset, just what waits for me. As sure as the years number a thousand or more, as sure as the sand lays at rest on the shore, just as sure as the clouds draw the rain from the sea, between here and sunset, God will take care of me. Between here and sunset, there are roads that are rough, many rocks on which we will stumble, but our Lord will lift us up. His mighty hand is there to guide us if we would only learn to lean. Between here and sunset, God will take care of me. He'll hold back the sun if it need to arise. The mountain is too steep. He'll just lower the skies. He'll exalt every valley when they are too rough. 
and deep between here and sunset, God will take care of me. So just thinking about it, at the end, every cloud of trouble, every cloud of trial, temptation, testing, look for God's rainbow because he put it there for you and for me. Let's pray.